A very good morning and welcome everyone to the AI for Social Good Summit. Um, we're really happy to have you uh, as part of the session this morning, which is going to be focusing on access to data, computing power, hardware, and infrastructure. So the, the session today is going to focus on a conversation that will tackle um, opportunities to enable access to some of those key inputs uh, for a thriving artificial intelligence ecosystem in your country. So things like data, computing power, um, but particularly from the perspective of how to address it for the social and development issues. And we want to look at this uh, uh, not just from the perspective of addressing some of those major risks around privacy, bias, um, safety, and fairness that come from uh, sort of the massive artificial intelligence adoption that we're seeing in different countries, but also from the perspective of how can we leverage the power of artificial intelligence for social good, uh, uh, for development? Um, how can we do that? from the perspective of policy. So what kind of policies can we create to uh, build this, these thriving uh, ecosystems in our countries and particularly to do so um, in the context of Asia. Now today's session is part of a broader set of sessions on uh, artificial intelligence for social good covering a variety of policy topics. Um, and so we have some interesting things happening across uh, the month. You may have joined us already uh, for the kickoff session. Um, and this is part of a, an, it's an extension of a report um, that you can download on AI for Social Good. So to go deeper on many of the topics that we will be uh, covering over the course of this month and the sessions that we'll be doing this month, everything from you know how do we incorporate um, ethics uh, uh, into artificial intelligence um, to some of the questions around you know what kind of adaptive policies uh, uh, do governments need um, in order to to really be able to take this forward. Um, you can go deeper uh, into that in the reports uh, uh, that we have uh, uh, on the AI for Social Good website. Now, in terms of today's agenda, we've got three major pieces. So the first piece is we wanna take an opportunity for everyone to meet uh, with each other. And so we're going to just carve out a, a few minutes for you to introduce yourselves uh, to each other. Uh, and we're going to have small breakout groups to do that. I'll explain that in a moment. Two is we're going to have a moderated discussion uh, and Q&A with a fantastic set of uh, uh, panelists and, and, and a moderator. Uh, and then the last piece is if you've received a notification in your email um, it, for a, a sort of a post session breakout, uh, uh, we'll have a number of different countries. We have five different Different countries that are uh, meeting together, different stakeholders uh, uh, meeting each other in, in these particular countries uh, after the panel uh, discussion. Uh, we'll, we'll be doing this again in some of the future uh, programs as well. So if your country uh, wasn't included in this one, no worries, we'll likely have uh, one of those meetings in one of the uh, upcoming uh, sessions as well. Um, so these are the three uh, parts of the program. The core part of the program is, of course, the first two pieces. And then if you've received an invitation uh, to join one of the country breakouts, then you'll also be participating uh, in this part at 1230. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to for us to take a moment to, to meet each other. So everyone who's here is, is interested uh, uh, in this agenda of artificial intelligence for social good. It's it's something that clearly you you care about because you've, you've made the time uh, uh, to be here. And so what I'd like to do is just spend about eight minutes and what we're going to put everyone into um, small breakout sessions. And so you'll have about three, you know, maybe four other people uh, in that breakout with you. And uh, I'd like you to introduce yourself. So, so where are you located? Um, what's your organization uh, and your role? Uh, that's, that's the first thing. So if you can just do a quick introduction. Uh, and then the second piece is to talk a little bit about your interest in, in artificial intelligence infrastructure, right? So, so for this session today, you know, what, what's, what's interesting for you? Why um, uh, did you take a, an interest in and join today's session uh, or this topic more generally? So these are going to be the two things. What's going to happen is we're gonna put you in a breakout uh, take a moment to briefly introduce yourself to the other participants in that smaller breakout um, and, then, and then share a little bit about uh, what your interest is in artificial intelligence and uh, infrastructure. And then what we'll do is we'll, we'll come back and we're going to kick off the panel discussion. So uh, let's head into the breakouts now. Uh, and so in a few moments, what will happen is you'll be put into a smaller room with other uh, participants. Welcome back, everyone. I, I hope you had the chance to uh, meet a few interesting people, uh, make a, perhaps make a few uh, useful connections. 
what I'd like to do now is I would like to introduce you to our moderator uh, for today. And so Priyank uh, Hirani is uh, consulting for the Rockefeller Foundation's uh, Asia Regional Office as the uh, data and technology lead. Um, and another thing that uh, uh, is interesting uh, about him is he previously served as the program director at the University of Chicago and Tata Center uh, for Development's Water to Cloud Initiative. So he was leading a team of scientists and technologists um, to collect, curate, and disseminate uh, data on water quality in Indian rivers um, through an open access uh, uh, pl digital platform. And I think we'll be talking today about data. Uh, data is a, a very important topic uh, uh, in this area. Uh, and so I want to go ahead and hand things uh, over to you, Priyank. Glad to hear from you. Great. Thanks so much, Carl. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, um, welcome, everyone. This is, uh, it's great to be here. Um, I will quickly introduce our panelists for the day. Um, and then I'll jump right in uh, to setting the context for the conversation for today. Um, our, uh, our first panelist uh, that I want to introduce is um, Dr. Panar Charitana, who is the executive director of the National Innovation Agency in Thailand. Um, he's actively engaged with various strategic projects in multi areas ranging, uh, ranging from uh, academia to national policy development, from his comprehensive education background in physics, economics, um, innovation management, and technology foresight. Um, so welcome, Dr. Charitana. Um, our next uh, speaker is um, Yuni Jiong. Um, he's a public policy professional with a hybrid experience comprising consulting, international development, and digital technology. Um, and is currently with the Telenor Group as a Director for Public and Regulatory Affairs Asia. Uh, she's joining us from Singapore, I believe. And um, our next speaker is Dr. Maslan, who is the Director of the International Science Council Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Um, she was with the Malaysian Civil Service spearheading the setup and was the head of the Planetarium Division um, to National Observatory in Langkawi and National Space Science. National Space Center in Selangor um, to welcome Dr. Maslan. Um, and um, our last speaker is uh, Professor Masaru Yarime, um, who is an associate professor at the Division of Public Policy in the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology with research interests centering around science, technology, and innovation policy for energy, environment, and sustainability. Um, he's also one of the co-authors for the AI for Social Good report that Carl mentioned earlier. Um, so very pleased to have all four of you with us today. Um, I'll quickly set the context for today's conversation and um, jump right in. Um, our, our interest at the, at the Rockefeller Foundation come into the topic um, from, uh, the way, uh, from, from the way we have uh, been working in the sector. So AI is a vastly complex topic um, this is, that is transforming the very fabric of our lives. Um, AI has many virtues as well as many risks, right? So all of us um, here understand um, that, that both these virtues and risks uh, need to be managed well, um, all of which are on vivid display during this time of global turmoil especially. Uh, in fact, the current pandemic is accelerating AI's integration into nearly every aspect of our lives um, in, in lots of good ways, but then we also need to be um, wary of, of the risk, right? So for example, uh, machine learning algorithms power cost-effective healthcare diagnostics for rural communities who would otherwise have no access to doctors um, or um, automate administrative tasks for teachers um, so that they can concentrate better on, on the students and the learning outcomes. Uh, or make cities smarter with AI-powered transport systems. Um, but there are increasing risks about uh, potential negative impacts, including um, an evolving digital divide, um, some ethical concerns, and the future of work. And, and we'll try and touch upon some of these aspects as, as, as we get into the conversation. Um, so the question arises, um, how do we manage AI's role in addressing the crisis um, and manage our recovery with uh, uh, manage our recovery that will undoubtedly um, um, define the next era. Um, so without further ado, um, let, let me start by asking Dr. Panard, um, from your experience of working um, with the government, uh, what kind of infrastructure do we need 
for AI applications to flourish. Um, where, where do you see sort of governments going wrong when it comes to investing in infrastructure for AI? Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we can categorize uh, infrastructures in this uh, specific so-called emerging technology into uh, uh, area. The first one is not that uh, complicated. Uh, the hardware, the roles of uh, hardware infrastructures, like uh, when we're talking about uh, data centers or uh, the government trying to uh, uh, develop innovation of the AI through smart city procurements. That's why we are thinking about public procurements. We, we're buying things from the government size. Uh, we're building up science parks. In, in many countries, we already have science parks, uh, but that's different anymore, I would say, when we are talking about AI. Uh, the, the hardware investment from the government, including private sectors, in many countries, uh, specifically in emerging economies, you already experience uh, quite a few number of mega projects regarding to data centers or even building up the space for startups uh, like a co-working space or data lab. But the second one, I think, is a bit more complicated than the first one. The first one, you can buy things, right? You can you can uh, develop a land uh, for the soft uh, soft side of the infrastructure. Uh, something like uh, when you already have a hard, hardware or physical infrastructures, uh, we rarely have a long-term plan or even a rolling plan regarding to how we're going to utilize uh, a big uh, infrastructures. We haven't got enough uh, human capital in many countries. So to speak, uh, quite a few number of countries, uh, I think all, all, all around the world want to have more quarter, right? including data scientists and people that develop their own new company, so-called uh, deep technology startup, to building up their own technology into a new business uh, model and uh, can work closely with the government and society. I believe that uh, the current topic today is about AI for social good. Then we need to, to be very clear what, what is social good and how uh, both infrastructure can be complement to each other. That's for the first uh, key questions. I think uh, the more challenges lies on how we manage uh, soft infrastructure, but not a uh, hard infrastructure or even uh, physical infrastructure. The second question is uh, where, where do I see the government going wrong uh, when it's come to investing uh, infrastructure from AI? I think it's, uh, it's quite uh, so-called difficult when we, we're talking about the paradigm shift. If you believe in, in the uh, uh, philosophy of science, when Thomas Kuhn mentioned about philosophy of, uh, of, of science, we're talking about uh, paradigm shift for many years. But if you take a look on the way the government uh, trying to invest, I think it's a good idea and it's already in a good track that the government in many countries, including Thailand, uh, they start to think about AI policy, start to building up a both hard and also soft uh, infrastructure. But I think the challenge lies on three specific ideas from the things that we already knew that uh, when we're talking about innovation in emerging technologies, people think like linear model, right? From research development to innovation, from science technology to innovation. But AI is very democratizing technologies. That's why we need to, to shift the paradigm from linear model uh, into uh, something called democratizing of innovation. When we're talking about democratizing innovation, I think it's very fit in with the AI for social goods in three specific ways. The first one, uh, the government uh, requires to think about how we set the right rules and regulation, not too much into something controlling the, the, the peoples or society, but to encouraging or facilitating people to use their own data are going to have the right experience and direct experience on some small project in a society or in, in, in a civil context. The second one, uh, it's, it's a bit more uh, so-called superficial when we're talking about agenda setting. When we're talking about agenda setting, it's a bit politicized, right? Who's gonna set the agenda? 
civil societies or the government, which, which level of the government, the national government or the provincial or even city government. From my experience, the cities or even district, uh, so-called local government and civil society can work on their own data set and AI to develop a city innovation. And the last one is about the right mindset, how we perceive AI as a democratizing tool that will bring in uh, a goodness of a social tool. I think I will end here. Thank, thanks so much, um, Panad. Um, that, that actually sets the, uh, yeah, the context of why um, the AI for social good space is so interesting and, and sort of how, how the different actors need to come together. Um, and I, I think one of the important players is going to be um, the private sector. Um, uh, Uni comes from the Telenor group, um, and I don't want to put you in a, in a spot, Uni, but uh, your work covers sort of um, several countries across the region, right? So I uh, wanted to get your views on um, he hearing Panaj and some of the work that you have done. What are the missing uh, pieces in the puzzle, uh, in, in the innovation infrastructure? Please. Sure. Thank you. And and very delighted to be here representing the private sector. Uh, I hope I can do the sector justice. Uh, but just for the benefit of the audience, uh, Telenor, we're a global uh, telecommunications company serving 108 million customers across nine countries uh, in Nordics in Asia. And our footprint in Asia um, can be considered emerging or frontier markets, uh, which include Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Myanmar, and slightly on the more developed side are Thailand and Malaysia. Um, and again, just to set the context for you know, the interests of a private sector uh, participating in a, uh, in a panel such as uh, AI for Social Good, um, Telenor's interest really comes from from our commitment to be a responsible business in across our footprints. And uh, the case in point is our uh, multi-year running initiative called Big Data for Good. We're hoping to transition the big data part into the AI uh, by participating in various um, framework setting discussions across EU and Asia, uh, such as the uh, ethical framework uh, for AI in Singapore, um, and um, uh, as well as uh, data governance uh, discussions within ASEAN. Um, so going back to the question at hand, um, the missing pieces uh, that we see in terms of innovation infrastructure uh, promoting AI uh, really stems from our own experience operating in Asia, wanting to uh, digitize and modernize our own operations, as well as raising the standards of the of, of our uh, not just our one uh, our own workforce, but uh, but as a country, uh, you know. Uh, considering the knock-on effects uh, that telcos, which are often one of the biggest employers and at the frontier of technological innovation in many of uh, these emerging markets. Um, the missing pieces uh, really stems from uh, the combination of uh, access to data uh, and computational power. Um, and I can cite two examples, uh, starting with uh, one from a Big Data for Good initiative. Um, we, um, some of you may have heard, uh, heard of our study or our partnership with Harvard University from 2015, where we looked at uh, the spread of, of dengue fever in, in Pakistan using mobility data. And since then, we've been looking for um, other applications uh, to use mobility data in epidemic related studies. And more recent example is a partnership with uh, Harvard University uh, looking at uh, multi-drug resistance malaria spread across uh, Bangladesh and Southeast Asia where we have some footprints. Um, to, the date, uh, to date, um, we've only been able to complete uh, the Bangladesh portion mainly because of the sensitivity uh, of the data that we're dealing with and the reluctance of, of the national authorities uh, in the countries that we have approached with the Harvard University, uh, where sharing of the data, whether even if we have uh, put in the right safeguards in place, such as anonymization of the data, um, therefore we are still in the process of working with uh, the national authorities to be 
safe to complete the multi-country uh, study uh, where we think the benefits uh, will be enormous uh, in terms of prevention and prediction of, um, of the spread of uh, MDR malaria, for example, in the region. Second um, example is closer to the core business, but at the same time, given the footprint of our operation, we think was going to be a seminal work in terms of kickstarting and activating, uh, activating the AI-driven uh, capabilities uh, of our operations in the region. Um, wanted to, we, we've been trying to start a pilot where we pull the data from our, um, our business units uh, in Asia, uh, utilizing a data center in Singapore, but training data scientists um, in each of our BUs uh, to analyze uh, using the pool of data, uh, but, uh, but using the computational power uh, that's already robust uh, and safe, uh, already established in, um, in, in a different jurisdiction. Um, we had some successes and failures, um, and in certain uh, business units, we had to put the project on hold, mainly because um, one, the country lacked uh, lacked uh, the data privacy and protection framework uh, in place, uh, in turn, uh, wasn't able to advise us on how we could um, share or transfer the data um, out of, out of the, the certain country to, um, to be pulled into the data center in Singapore, um, which highlights um, highlights the issues as, as one of the private companies, and I can't say this is the same for a lot of others, is that even if there is a willingness to share the data, and we believe as not just because we're a mobile operator, but we do believe that mobile data, be it the mobility data, communications data, or personal data, are, have, uh, can be a tremendous asset that can um, for, for unleashing societal goods. It can be used in urban planning, you know, public health, uh, uh, just the way, uh, um, just as our examples from Pakistan and Bangladesh have demonstrated transportation or financial inclusion initiatives. But the, the frameworks um, in, in data governance in some of these countries um, are still more geared toward, um, in, or they're rather, still inward looking. Um, there are concerns around national security. There are concerns around data, um, data privacy, um, which are all legitimate concerns, but also lack that forward leaning, uh, the forward leaning uh, foresights um, and appetite to unleash, um, unleash the, the power through, um, through works of uh, companies like ours. Great, great. No, thank you so much for that. Um, what I what I heard from what you said is, um, sort of no matter how sophisticated the AI algorithms become, um, it can only work effectively in an environment where um, sort of the data sets are properly, responsibly, ethically um, generated and stored. Um, there's necessary computing power, as you said, um, and and there's reliable and affordable um, access to expertise and the internet, right? Um, and, and I think here's where I wanted to bring in Dr. Maslan, uh, because you have worked at, uh, at the front lines of fighting for open data and open science. Um, so what do you think, um, like, what do you find uh, works when it comes to making science and data open and sort of what doesn't work? You, you're on mute, Dr. Maslan. Oops, okay, here we go. Thank you, thank you, Piranka. Um, yes, indeed, there are compelling reasons for making science and data open. Firstly, you know, with open science, I would just could call it open science, and that includes open data as well. It can give us greater access to all the scientific inputs and outputs, which uh, most of it is public uh, fund, funds driven anyway, because it can improve the effectiveness and productivity of the entire research system. How? By reducing duplication, and you allow more research to be carried out on the same data uh, bits, and you, of course, will multiply opportunities for participation in the, the whole research process. Um, not only that, the open access uh, to those 
outputs will support the research process in a wider evaluation and scrutiny by the scientific community. We talk about trust, so how much can we trust data, how much can we trust uh, conclusions and, and uh, how much fraud is there. So this will give us the quality and integrity that we need by making that science data and the science uh, open. And open science, um, that, uh, we've, in the past, we've had to wait months or years before we can share uh, our papers and somebody will uh, you know, respond. But now we can, um, of course, look at the data very quickly and open science can indeed reduce delays in the uh, reuse, and as I said before, in, the, in checking the quality and integrity of the, of the data. Now, at the societal level, Open science is important because science should be open for the whole society. Remember, I said that most of scientific research is public uh, funded, publicly funded anyway. But um, by provide by making science open, uh, you create awareness amongst uh, citizens, and this actually will help build trust and support. We we heard about trust and support um, for public policies in general. And, and some other investments that the government, whoever needs to make. And this also serves uh, a citizens' um, engagement. As we all know, we've talked about citizen science and all that. And that is only possible through making science open. And lastly, which is the best to me, is that open science inevitably leads to international um, collaboration. And open science promotes this uh, international collaboration in such a um, it doesn't matter you're from the developing or developed countries, the, the platforms are there. But let me say it, though, that um, the challenge here, though, is that uh, while there are scientists who agree or identify with this open science uh, concept, they have not made plans, not many of them, uh, to adopt um, open science mainly because the existing research funding and evaluation structures offer no incentives for sharing. So we need to address this urgently. But let's say we're able to incentivize this cooperative uh, be behavior. There are still lingering doubts because there are concerns that the data and the results can be misused by others and also misinterpreted by unintended uh, audience. Again, uh, we also refer to that. And this is the thing, that the movement can unleash into the public domain large amounts of data that, which is beyond our capacity. Now, the capacity to, to handle. Now, this is where, where AI comes in. And um, the AI experts here will attest to this, you know, the, the powers of uh, AI. And we all know today that COVID-19 is a testament to the potential that AI can make. It has given us an excellent example of the indispensable role AI has um, played in modeling, in information extraction, retrieval, uh, dissemination, answering questions, and summarizing. So yeah, the role of AI in open science is unquestionable, and both must come together. Thank you, Priyanka. Thank you, Vijayan. Yeah. Great, great. Thanks, thanks, uh, Marzan. Um, so what, what I'm hearing from um, all of our speakers um, is, is, is the central role of um, data uh, in, in um, governance um, the, and also the where, where should the decision making powers lie, right? Or who should be um, brought to the table? And as going back to uh, Panad's uh, earlier comments, um, should, should the decisions around data governance, uh, working with data, et cetera, be at the city level, at, at sort of provincial level or the national level or maybe at the regional level. Um, and I, I think this, this provides a natural segue into some of the things that Professor Masaru was, uh, has, has been talking about in the report, right? Um, so sort of uncertainty and unpredictability are, are inherent to inherent characteristics of emerging technologies um, and cannot be eliminated. Um, however, there, there are uh, at, at different uh, levels of governance, there are some uh, areas where, um, where, where um, governments are, are seemingly doing better, right? Um, you've spoken about in, in the chapter that you wrote on governing data-driven innovation for sustainability. We talked about the opportunities and challenges for regulatory 
sandboxes for smart cities. Um, it was interesting for me to read about some of these experiments and how a sandbox approach uh, to testing AI technologies is a possibility uh, that you've discussed in the report. Um, so we wanted to understand sort of as, as cities become one level of government, one level of governance, uh, where we seem to be making real progress, right? Uh, in terms of access to data, in terms of uh, getting all the players right uh, uh, together and working towards this. Um, so, so how are cities different, right? And, and once there's willingness to provide data, what else uh, are the missing elements here that we need to think about when it comes to infrastructure? Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Priyam. Um, yes, um, I think, um, well, I have been working on uh, innovation policy for um, some years. And then that um, traditionally we are dealing with uh, uh, some of the more traditional areas like electronics, chemicals, and the uh, steel making and others. But then we, when we come to AI, which is based on learning and adaptation. So uh, in a way, the as other speakers mentioned that access to data and how to manage data will be uh, very important. And then that we actually need to use this data um, and, and then to, to test it on the ground with the stakeholders so that uh, we can really facilitate the, the machine learning, for example, in the case of AI. So um, I think uh, one of the key um, uh, features of AI is that uh, you can't really uh, predict what to be the direction of evolution, uh, technological progress. And then sometimes you can't explain how you end up with a particular outcome. Um, so it means that um, that's really a challenge for policymakers, for example, in the case of regulating uh, safety and regulating um, the environmental protection and others, so that we really need to work together with the innovators and also stakeholders involved in cities. And then, as I mentioned, that why cities would be particularly um, uh, appropriate for this kind of uh, uh, the role of uh, facilitating innovation is that probably um, we need to uh, limit the space or we need to specify the boundaries uh, of the area where we can test all uh, this new innovation in the sense that um, we don't know what will be uh, the key challenges, what will be the opportunities um, uh, the, from the beginning. So we need to test it and then we need to involve the users so that we can really uh, the kind of facilitate the cycle of uh, uh, making uh, the trials and then making mistakes and then we learn uh, from mistakes and then we adjust it quickly. So uh, to do so, probably we can't do it at the national level. Um, so probably it's important to limit the space and then we can identify the stakeholders and then we can have a, maintain a cross collaboration, cross communication with the innovators and also the regulators. So, um, and then probably we can um, uh, uh, the, the learn uh, the, the problems um, and then um, probably uh, we can uh, use that findings to change the regulation at the national level later so that uh, we can somehow expand um, the, the scope for uh, uh, using the new technologies coming. Um, so I think essentially uh, what we need to think about is this learning and adaptation. And then to do so, we need to create a kind of space for trial and error. So that in that sense, that regulatory sandbox is a one way to do uh, kind of uh, uh, the, uh, the facilitating the learning. So, um, but then that obviously there are some other challenges in the sense that um, as in the case of autonomous vehicles, and uh, I think there are some accidents uh, during this the trials in, in some uh, areas, uh, particularly in the case of the US, for example. So um, there are some concerns about how we can really uh, manage uh, the, the risks involved in this kind of experiment. Um, so in that sense, again, that probably we need to emphasize close collaboration, communication between regulators and also the innovators. And also with regard to uh, data, uh, what kind of data you need to collect and manage. And to do so, we need to have a consensus uh, among the stakeholders, including residents there. So um, again, that means that probably we need to limit the space where we can really identify key stakeholders involved. So um, in that sense that I think regulatory sandbox would be one uh, very interesting uh, approach to, uh, uh, to try to govern all these uncertainties and also unpredictabilities of uh, AI technologies.
Hey, thank, thank you for your comments, uh, Masaru. Um, this, this actually reminds me of um, what Tia uh, Khan, the senior vice president at the Rockefeller Foundation, mentioned in um, the EI Plus One report that was launched earlier this year, um, where he talks about how um, AI will be sort of uh, ubiquitous, um, omnipresent in, in the background of day-to-day -day life, right? So there's no escape from that, um, just like electricity. And um, it, it's uh, sort of, we need to shape uh, the AI technology. Uh, we, we need to shape AI as a technology uh, that will uh, weave together our integrated future with human plus the digital um, world, right? So my question to all the panelists, um, and feel free to jump in, um, whoever want to chime in, um, sort of how, how do we ensure, uh, or how do we make AI more responsible, more inclusive, more ethical? Um, anyone can answer this. I can give it a first go um, and let the, <laughs> let the real expert to jump in uh, later on. Um, I think when it comes to use of data and AI at large, um, I think we see two uh, approaches across the globe. One I would term as right-based approach uh, coming out of uh, Europe and more market-based um, from Asia, US, um, as well as China. And, I think that you know, in order to ensure that the benefits of AI outweigh um, the risks as well as threats, um, is really looking closely at how we can uh, combine this right base as well as market based, um, and and sort of get the best out of the both world. Um, EU is able to to take on the right base because of uh, of uh, data privacy and protection. Uh, uh, is embedded as, as a fundamental right, um, which can also um, uh, hamper innovations in, in certain areas. At the same time, you know that that ensures that uh, the beneficiaries um, or uh, or the subject uh, data subjects um, are not left behind, or uh, they won't consent to something that that might ultimately harm them in the future. Right. When it comes to market base, that's where you know we give more breathing room for companies uh, and individuals to experiment. Um, and so uh, I'm I'm absolutely with Masaru Zhang when it comes to use of um, sandbox approach, for example, where we can really build uh, the trust by uh, by confining the parameters of how um, AI can be developed in or different use cases can be developed, but by defining the parameters and, and putting it into control, um, we are able to see uh, the unintended consequences and address them. I would like to elaborate uh, more from uh, Yuni mentioned about uh, the model right and market base, I think uh, if you take a look from the innovation uh, studies uh, concept, so-called framework condition, uh, quite a few numbers of the speaker mentioned about uh, the changing roles of key stakeholder. I think uh, at this moment, uh, the research triangle model that we believe in, uh, it cannot work for AI because uh, there are at least two new uh, key stakeholders, non-enterprise, so-called civil society, uh, social enterprise or civic group, or even uh, digital libertarian. This group of people, they are non-firm. They, are, they, are, they used to be a users of the innovation, but now they can innovate by themselves. Uh, that's why I, I keep talking about democratizing of innovation. The second group of people, uh, uh, I think they are the, the, the shifting from the role of traditional academician because of the institutional setup of the universities is already shaking up. A lot of people in, in the new, new and younger generation, they do not believe in diploma. Even they have a technology, they believe in the experience-based societies. So in that sense, I think uh, uh, framework conditions already shake the roles of the government, being a regulators or being a facilitator. But at the same time, universities and research technology organization that own physical infrastructures. We keep talking about access to, to, to data, right? But at the end of the day, quite a few number of countries, the government in specific uh, department, they are very reluctant to share or to open the data to the public. 
that's why the user generated data become uh, very crucial and the city level can be a playground for the sandbox. Again, I think when we're talking about firms, we have startups, we have uh, social enterprise, but they are not corporate, right? So in that sense, I think the framework condition that we believe in the traditional innovation, it, can, it already being uh, uh, trans, translated into something different, it's differences of framework condition. That's why I think the roles of the government and university at this moment being checked by the civil society that's used to be the users. So this is a juggling between the, the old power and the new power. That's why AI for good, we should talk about politics of, uh, of AI and data. Great. Yeah, well, yes. if I may. Um, yeah, actually, I, I got the question um, the, through the chat. And uh, well, with regard to regulatory sandbox, um, uh, one challenge is that uh, what is called uh, uh, regulatory arbitrage in the sense that, uh, in a way, there might be a kind of a race to the bottom in the sense that uh, many different regions try to uh, deregulate all the regulations so that they can invite all these innovators. So that, uh, but then th that would be uh, uh, one um, potential uh, 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 consequence uh, in the sense that um, somehow we try to coordinate um, between different uh, regions and different uh, sandbox in the sense that probably we need to maintain a certain level of um, uh, kind of a safeguard uh, system in the sense that uh, we need to uh, provide uh, a certain protection to safety and also privacy and that so that uh, in a way that we can maintain uh, at least a certain level of uh, um, the, uh, the societal benefits. And then that uh, one key challenge to regulate the sandbox is to uh, scale up uh, in the sense that uh, there are many pilot projects which somehow didn't succeed to scale up. And uh, that's really a big challenge. And uh, probably uh, one factor which is important is how close we can work together with the stakeholders and then how, how um, uh, intense uh, in the sense that uh, how we can really conduct um, the experimentation together with the stakeholders and then uh, the accumulate the learning. And then also um, to scale up, probably we need to, um, in the end, go up to the national level in the sense that we need to probably change the regulations and policy. So which means that uh, we, you also need to communicate with the policymakers at, at the higher level. So, and then policymakers also um, at the national level also need to take, pay, pay attention to uh, what's, what's going on and what to be the outcome. So which means that all the results and the findings need to be communicated and disseminated widely. So um, the whole system will be very important for scaling up um, while uh, protecting the societal uh, uh, the, the, the benefits and also addressing the concerns. Great, great. So I, I really like uh, the idea of democratizing innovation that Anad spoke about and sort of seeing the role of governments as, as being facilitators and and um, what uh, Masar brought in uh, regarding um, the, the, um, the whole experiment for scaling up and, and some of the challenges and opportunities there. Um, we're coming uh, to a close for this session, so I want to give um, just one um, quick uh, um, uh, just, just want to get like a couple of sentences um, from all of you on um, what do you see sort of as, as a future opportunity um, on that that we should explore to build uh, a better few foundation for AI for social good. Uh, very quick comments. Okay, let <laughs> let me do first one. I think uh, we are approaching. Uh, to the quadruple, quadruple helix innovation platform uh, that we start to embrace uh, societies and uh, civic uh, tech at large as a key partner, but not a beneficiary group. That's why uh, we, we can maneuver uh, at the emerging technology that we call AI. Thank you. Um, let me speak to open science, please, Priyank. Um, um, I want to say that scientific output is a public resource and open access to these materials is absolutely necessary to enhance productivity and innovation as I have mentioned before. Now, this is the foundation of um, open science. So AI holds the key 
to unleashing the potential and opportunities for open science uh, to serve the public good. Thank you. From my end, um, you know, the Holy Trinity of AI is, you know, there's the algorithmic uh, prowess that's required, but the basic ingredients are really data and access to, to computational power. Um, not, notwithstanding the legitimate concerns of the government around national security and trust, there are ways, there are stepping stones that they can explore to, to reorient uh, themselves toward and, and more, uh, be more open to innovations and, and build AI capabilities. Uh, regulatory sandbox is one. Uh, there are other um, other ways, such as uh, data trusts, uh, where you know we can uh, have an independent uh, steward of data, where different organizations can can contribute, which can be the foundation um, input for for AI for societal good uh, in various countries as well. Um, so um, you know, promote experiment. <laughs> I think that's uh, one of the key ways uh, that we ensure that AI for, for good um, is, uh, is promoted in our region. Okay, and Masaru? Okay, um, yeah, just following up uh, what uh, Yuni mentioned that uh, probably we need to uh, facilitate experimentation and the learning, and then probably we need to share the experiences um, um, among different countries and regions. Um, so that we can learn uh, from others' experience and from others' mistakes. And to do so, probably we need to, I don't know, establish a kind of forum or arena where we can share all the experiences. And somehow I think OECD, um, um, uh, uh, something like OECD can play a, a role of that kind of uh, uh, the, the, the place. And also actually I'm involved in uh, G20, um, uh, uh, smart city alliance for technological governance in the sense that they're trying to establish a kind of common policy uh, framework and principles. So um, all this um, the uh, arena would be, I guess, very useful. And uh, in that sense, I, I guess that um, the organizations like APRU and the UNSCAP and also private sectors like Google can also work together to um, somehow um, the, uh, set up uh, such a kind of place where we can really exchange and learn from each other. Great, great. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having all four of you join us in this discussion today. Um, I just want to close with a couple of comments and sort of uh, my thoughts on what, what summarizing the discussion today. Um, it's true that technological advances um, have always disrupted society. Right. AI is no different in that sense. Um, however, AI does bring a step change uh, from prior technologies for the, how it influences um, all aspects of uh, the nature of our interactions, right? Um, and, and how significant um, it is in, in the uh, ways in which it touches our lives. Um, the, its, its impact, its effects are not fully understood. Um, they, they are, uh, they are, um, but we know that the consequences are going to be uh, long lasting and it's gonna impact um, how we organize our society. So um, as the Rockefeller Foundation, in fact, as all of you said, we um, think that uh, the, the questions need to be addressed more deeply before we jump into answers, but also um, it's important for us to have these peer informed discussions and then create projects that can be implemented in a practical format to see how we talk about AI governance. Um, and and um, in, uh, starting next month, we're in fact hosting um, a, a forward looking gathering to continue this discussion um, and we'll, we'll think more on these lines. So thank you so much for um, Masaru, Kwanaj, Yuni and Mazlan um, and over to you, Carl. Thanks so much, everyone. And uh, thank you to all of our uh, speakers and uh, to you, Priyank, as well, for helping us moderate this session. So if you were invited for one of the uh, country breakouts, uh, we're going to jump into those uh, right now. So we have uh, Philippines and Japan, uh, participants for Philippines and Japan, uh, who, who will be 
uh, uh, connecting together. Uh, if you're not, I just want to remind you that we have an excellent program uh, of sessions uh, happening all month uh, as part of AI for Social Good. Um, our next session uh, is on November 5th uh, around build, building AI uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, you know, one of our speakers will be uh, the CEO for Singularity University. We just got a fantastic panel for this session. Um, and then we've got uh, on November 12th, so we'll be looking at some of the different policy insights on enabling environment. So that's uh, that's uh, it for everyone who uh, is taking part as a participant. Um, now, for today, we have these two breakouts that are going to be meeting. So participants from Japan and the Philippines on November 5th. Uh, if you are uh, from one of these countries that I have listed here, you'll want to join us on November 5th. This is when we're doing uh, these meetups. We've got Bangladesh, we've got Hong Kong, India, Singapore, South Korea, and Thailand uh, uh, all uh, meeting up on November 5th, but for today, we've got our participants uh, from Japan and the Philippines. Now, for those of you who are from Japan and the Philippines and who will be uh, meeting up, we've got uh, uh, kind of a, a couple of uh, key notes for you. This is how we're going to run the session. So one is uh, around the purpose. Um, so this is really a, a space for um, different stakeholders to connect. We're going to give you folks about half an hour uh, to get the chance to meet other people. Everyone uh, who is part of this session has joined because you really uh, care about this cause. This is something that you're in a, a space that you want to, to do something about, a, leveraging AI for social good. And so we want to create a space for different stakeholders to meet each other, but also um, to uncover some opportunities where perhaps you might uh, uh, collaborate on, on your country's uh, AI agenda. And we're going to have four steps. Uh, uh, and we're going to have someone in the rooms with you, but we'll have four steps for these conversations. So one is we're going to suggest that you uh, pick a facilitator uh, for your group, right? Someone from your country. Uh, and uh, and the reason for that is it just enables you to have a, a, a discussion in whatever language uh, you like. So, you know, for our Japanese colleagues, if you'd like to speak in Japanese, uh, there's, there's, uh, that's absolutely possible because you don't uh, need to work with an English speaking facilitator like me. Uh, number two, is uh, we'll do introductions, right? So just do some brief introductions. What do you do? What's your interest uh, in AI uh, for social good? Three is, is to talk about what are some of the opportunities. So we just ended our panel discussion talking about opportunities, right? Uh, um, are there some that you think are more interesting uh, for your country? Uh, are there some that weren't mentioned perhaps that, that you think might be very interesting? Uh, and then the fourth piece is next step. So what are some areas um, that you might like to discuss uh, further uh, outside of this session? So that, that those are going to be the four pieces uh, for those discussions. And, and, and once again, uh, we're going to be doing these with participants from uh, Japan and the Philippines uh, for these country breakouts. And if I could ask my colleagues uh, to go ahead and open up the uh, country breakouts. Uh, we'll uh, head in there and for Japan and the Philippines. We'll head in there and then we'll do some uh, 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 quick introductions. We'll pick a facilitator and we'll get the conversation started. <laughs> 